Um, as you can see, the, the topic of the first panel, sustainable cities, future city living, and um, I'm delighted that um, we have got um, the cream of um, the UK-based engineering profession um, on the, uh, the platform because, as again many of you will well know, um, if there's anywhere that um, leads the world in engineering these days, um, it is um, the UK and the firms that are, that are based here. And uh, four of our um, speakers and panelists are um, leaders of that um, profession, starting um, from this end with um, Keith Clark who was, um, for a considerable number of years, the chief executive of, of um, W.S. Atkins and uh, is now, amongst other things, the government's senior advisor on sustainability. And in a minute, um, Keith is going to, um, to, to talk to um, get this session underway. And then on the panel, um, next to Keith, we have um, Terry Hill, the chairman of the Arab Group Trusts, uh, we have Sir John Armit, who, as I already mentioned, um, in his most recent um, uh, post has been the chairman of the Olympic Delivery Authority. So this is, this is the man that, that um, has overseen the building of these fantastic um, facilities that we've got for the Olympics. And before that, uh, he was the chief executive of Network Rail. Um, we then have Dr. Uwe Kruger, who is the current CEO uh, of Atkins. And at the far end, um, Paul Skinner, somebody who um, is one of our most senior businessmen as a former group managing director of Shell, as chairman of RTZ, and who now helps government as the chairman of Infrastructure UK bridge um, business uh, and government as we think about um, how we deliver the infrastructure challenge. So that's the, um, the panel. And Keith, can I ask you to um, kick it off for us? Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, are we on? Yes. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, Minister uh, Lord Sassoon. Um, I'm not going to talk about our medals, but I can talk about Tour de France, which is a small victory for the UK of Bradley Wiggins. That's something we should be immensely proud about because it's about excellence. It's not about just spreadsheets, it's about excellence. So I'm going to quickly go through a number of issues. We have an extraordinary heritage of design and engineering, of construction, from the Industrial Revolution. That's left us with institutions like the Institute of Civil Engineers, like the Royal Institute of British Architects, and the Royal uh, uh, ISTRUC T, the Royal Society, the Royal Academy of Engineering which are world-class institutions. There are groups of people that have a heritage and culture of looking at the question we have to answer tomorrow. And that's our history, a deep history of doing things differently. We're one of the first countries in the world to look at privatization of some excellent engineering industries, central electricity board, the coal board, had great engineering depths, and we privatized them earlier than any other country. We've gone through PFI earlier than any other country. And we have a heritage of looking beyond what today's problem is. There's some things as a context which actually aren't for tomorrow's world, they're for today's world. The UK has the most stringent anti-corruption laws in the world. We should be proud of that, because corruption actually not only rewards the wrong people, it corrupts the product that you're buying. It denigrates the quality of what you're buying. We have an ethnically diverse society, successfully an ethnically diverse society. And for a global economy, which we're embracing with enthusiasm, that is essential. It is essential for a civilized society. And that is the world we are stepping into, an ethnically diverse global economy. And what skills we have to cope with the unpredictability of that world, which is an unpredictable world. On top of that, we have climate change. Now, climate change is an interesting phenomenon. It is leading to a revolution in the way we run our economies. And it is the next industrial revolution. And climate change isn't about the Greens arguing, doing nothing. It's about giving dignity and jobs to our societies, to your children, 
to allow them to prosper and have careers and have dignity and have a worthy existence in a society they're proud of without destroying the planet, which will destroy them. Now, to cope with climate change, the UK has the most progressive laws in the world. The Climate Change Act is the most progressive current legislation anywhere in the world. 80% reduction in our CO2 profile for the economy by 2050. An extraordinary measure, supported by all three parties when it went through Parliament. I think uh, uh, there was a Labour government at the time, but all three parties strengthened it as it went through the House of Lords. To decarbonise one's industrialised society, post-industrial society like ours, by 80% from where we are, is an extraordinary challenge. You add to that the increase in urbanisation around the world. Let's remember, 136 countries signed up at COP18 at Copenhagen to actually agree that we would reduce the global average tempering in increase to less than two degrees, which broadly speaking means that the way we have run our economy since the Industrial Revolution is about to radically change. You're not going to do this with financial engineering, you're going to do it with engineering, you're going to do it with design, you're doing it with all the disciplines that go into infrastructure. Now, why is the UK well placed to deal with this, apart from having the best legislation in the world, apart from having anti-corruption, apart from having an enormous heritage? It's because we have judgment. The one thing you can buy from the UK is professional judgment. And if you want excellence, as opposed to a spreadsheet, if you want the answer for tomorrow's solution rather than yesterday's solution, you're looking for judgment. You're looking for people, groups of people, who are able to look at problems holistically, outside of their own skill set, and work as teams. Teams with the client, teams with the population, teams with the politicians who are locally, teams with the bankers, who can actually engineer a world that doesn't exist today. And the work that's been going on in the Olympics with Arabs and Mott's and WSP and Atkins and Carillion and Balfour, world-class companies doing world-class work. That's not the work you'll buy from them tomorrow. The work you'll buy from them tomorrow is what we're going to give you for tomorrow's solution. We should already be out of date with the enormous achievements that's been achieved by the Olympics. We should already be looking beyond that. And that's what we can sell you. We can sell you judgment. And from judgment comes excellence. You look at King's Cross, the new station work there. John McCaslin's done it with Arabs, I think and WSP, excellent work. Let's go to the living world, the cities, more than half of the globe's population, which is going to reach nine billion people. Regardless, it is going to reach nine billion people. And most of those are gonna live in cities. And they're gonna be cities which are gonna to have to work with an efficiency which is unheard of to date. It is impossible to carry on urbanizing at the rate of CO2 or CO2 absorption which we have done for the last 150 years. It is a radical revolution. Who do you want on your side for that revolution? Now, the world is actually quite difficult anyway because infrastructure, by definition, is always too little, too much, too early or too late. You're looking at a future which is unpredictable. You've got to, sometimes it takes 10 years to build a piece of infrastructure, five years at the shortest. You're always looking at a future scenario which at best is vague. Adding to that, that we're looking at how we embed CO2 in and operate our cities, our built environment, our infrastructure, that question becomes infinitely more complex. It goes beyond normal process. It goes into art. And the best engineering, the best construction, the best architectural design is an art. And if you go to the Olympics, you will see art. You won't see science, you'll see art, underpinned by enormous depth of engineering. That's why the UK is being successful. That's why we still export knowledge. I was with um, an Arab friend last night at one of the uh, open, uh, uh, open houses, Qatari, who'd just done a, a PhD in looking at knowledge economies. And what is a knowledge economy? And people tend to talk about um, uh, systems, and they tend to talk about funny hubs. And he'd spent two years on this thesis, and his conclusion was 
Actually, it's about people. It is about people. It's about people excelling. And what context do you have to make people excel? It's actually the institutional and cultural framework. It's their heritage, it's their values, it's what people do, not when the question is easy, but it's what they do when the question is extraordinarily difficult. And that's when you see excellence. It's a little bit like health and safety, which I'm proud to say the UK design and construction industry has done enormous advances on. Enormous advances. Because it's quite reasonable that your children should go home from work. It's quite reasonable that people at work from you should return from work healthy. The people you employ should return from work healthy. That's something deeply embedded in the UK industry. Huge strides have been made in the last decade with that, both in the consulting fields and the construction fields. Why do UK firms be bought by, Ameri by American companies? Because we have quality of people. We have people who are able to exercise judgment in extraordinary situations and give you a quality of the future that your children, living in cities and celebrating life, because a technical solution that doesn't give dignity gives you nothing. A railway station that merely works is a failure. Go to Canary Wharf, look at the quality of space, go to the Olympic Park, go to anywhere in London, look at the quality of space. The new space, the new architecture, the new engineering. That's what you should be proud of in 20 years' time at the end of your careers. Not that you just brought it in on budget, that you brought it in on cost, you brought it in without killing people, that your inf infrastructure actually was low carbon, all of those things. But that piece of city, that piece of infrastructure, is something that you would celebrate with your family as giving dignity of place, of quality. We're not holding this event in a porter cabin. We're holding it in part of our heritage. It's a place to be proud. It's a place to be celebrated. Mayfair is a place to be celebrated. Private sector at its best in Mayfair. We have that in the future. We have it in Canary Wharf. We have it in Docklands. We have it in other parts of the UK. And the engineering profession, and I engineer and I include all the architects, cost, the environmentalists. Engineering is a very broad church of skills these days, and it should be. We have world-class people who can service you. We, can have world, we have world-class institutions and we have world-class companies full of extraordinary people. Our big failing, we're too modest, far too modest. We don't sell. Compared with the Americans, we don't sell. We tend to sort of say, we can certainly do things, but we do it very quietly. But when you're in trouble, the people that get hired UK engineers, UK architects, UK environmentalists, UK business people. They're the people that excel for tomorrow's world, which is going to be more complex than today's world. That is something we should celebrate. Thank you very much.